Okay, hello. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming and for joining us here. Um, today's panel is uh, entitled uh, Digital Art and Digital Futures, Unpack the Unpacking the Complexities of Computational cu uh, Culture. Um, over the past decade, uh, institutions and practices of digital art have definitely uh, undergone a huge amount of profound changes brought about by the ubiquity of uh, digital technologies and uh, computational algorithms. These technologies and these algorithms have definitely touched on uh, pretty much every aspect of our day to day. They're no longer just considered technical objects, but they're also considered social objects that enact various different types of relations between humans and, and between machines as well. So in when we're thinking about kind of the production of cultural work. We, uh, definitely the, the idea of technology or what technology does has uh, redefined how we think, how we learn, and how we socialize, and how we work. They've uh, facilitated new spaces for cultural engagement and provided us with opportunities to rethink, reinvent radically the ways in which publics engage and think about digital art itself. Simultaneously, while all these uh, new kind of a very kind of uh, idealistic and new, new ways of doing things have emerged, the conditions under which culture it's, and its public discourse is produced is incre increasingly subjective to complexities that arise from technology and from its intersection with market policies and demands. So as cultural practitioners, we are continuously developing ways to unpack these conditions and to understand kind of our sometimes often contradictory positions within these uh, infrastructures and within with these practices as well. <clears throat> These concerns allow us to kind of uh, rethink and create with contemporary institutional economic and technological constraints and possibilities. But uh, the panel here today is going to discuss really how we unpack or how we understand the role of technology in the creation and manipulation of these concerns and how do we determine and reshape <coughs> the formation of a digital art canon uh, that is in lots of ways continuously shifting and also being eroded by things like economic instabilities, by corporate agendas, and also by the banality of trends. So I'm joined today by uh, three practitioners, or sorry, three uh, uh, three individuals, I guess, maybe would say. Uh, there is Regine Jabadi, who uh, is a writer and a critic, and she has a website called We Make Money Not Art. Uh, Sabine from HEK, who speaks on behalf of the institution based in Basel, and yes, so double checking to get that right. And uh, Alexander Schulz, who is here from Creative Art, uh, Creative Applications, sorry, and uh, also is the editor of Holo Magazine, then as well. So together, we are going to be kind of discussing kind of um, various different kind of perspectives and to look at the ways in which we are unpacking and considering and thinking critically about issues that are emerging with uh, the speed of digital technologies and uh, how culture is being uh, very rapidly kind of informed and shaped by these issues, and as well. So today's session is going to be at the beginning. We're going to have three different presentations, one from each one of our speakers. And then we're going to have a, a very a long discussion about maybe kind of some of our, uh, I guess, intersections and maybe, uh, uh, maybe separations and some of these things and as well. So first up, we have Regine. So uh, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Can I, how can I get my slides on the screen? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, oh, and <laughs> oh, how can I see my my slides? Well, these are not my slides. Sorry, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, 
So I had a look when I prepared uh, the discussion, I had a look at uh, the questions that uh, Nora uh, was asking, and uh, I decided to focus on one of them, uh, which is how do we collectively imagine potential futures for digital art, because, well, it's a very engaging and interesting question. Everybody uh, likes to talk about the future, but also because I think um, it's important um, to uh, not just talk about the future, but maybe take a step back and have a look at uh, what we've achieved or failed to achieve so far in, in, in art and technology. And I think it's important to assess that before, before looking at what, what we can do next. And um, yeah, before I continue, I have to uh, give a warning is that I have a very specific perspective. I would never uh, define myself as being an expert in digital art. Rather than that, I, I think I'm more um, interested in, in, I've been covering art and science, uh, uh, yeah, art and science, art and technology for a number of years, and mo but mostly from, uh, uh, I'm more interested in practices that engage with social issues. So I, I'm going to uh, pronounce the words that is so fashionable uh, nowadays. I'm interested in activism and how designers, artists, and, and hackers are using technology and, and science in, in creative ways. Um, yes, um, but that doesn't mean that I do not enjoy uh, other types of work. So here is the work by an artist I really like, is Takashi Murakami, and uh, I would not associate his work with the most robust uh, forms of protest. And yes, I still really, really love his work. So it's not a critique. I'm not going to talk uh, about everybody should get in, engaged and, and fight. I'm just, I'm just taking the, the point of view of the observer as someone who's been writing and observing and, and discussing the way artists are using technologies. And I observed that um, the discussion has not really moved on that much. When I started uh, 13 years ago, I keep hearing the same criticism and the same complaints and the same uh, anxieties being repeated over and over again. And I think it's important we look at those before, you know, talking about the future. Uh, well, the first one is the obvious one. Uh, everybody knows about it. We are still stuck in the 80s. Uh, there is still a, a lack of diversity in the contemporary world in general. Uh, in, in the media world, uh, uh, new media world uh, especially. Um, so I'm sure you know the guerrilla girls, they're still fighting and they still have very good reason to do, to do so. Uh, they were fighting at the time against the fact that they were, women were underrepresented and, um, and that people who are not uh, European and, and American and with white skin are also like tragically underrepresented in the art world. Um, Women are not just sitting and, and complaining about it. Uh, last year, uh, a number of uh, new media artists, women new media artists, launched this uh, online protest against the fact, like criticizing the fact that uh, a major new media art festival, such as Ars Electronica, um, was uh, almost systematically giving the, the main awards to, to men. And that was last year, and I think yesterday or two days ago, the result of the, of the the Ars Electronica competition were released, and I would say Ars Electronica is doing some really, really timid steps in cleaning, in cleaning up their, their acts. I think they probably could do more. And uh, I, also, I also have the feeling that, uh, well, two things I want to add on this topic. Uh, some festivals, and I would say even some countries, are better than, than others. Like, Clearly, when you have a look at the program at, at mapping, I cannot, tell, I, I cannot say, well, well, mapping, there are way too many men. Um, I mean, have a look at this panel. There, there, are, there are quite a few women. Um, so I would say it depends. It depends also on the country. I absolutely love France. I love going there. But uh, pff, how many times have I been to a media art festival or, or conference and half, at least half the audience are women and on stage they are only men, not mainly men, only men. And the other thing I want to mention is that I don't think this is a fight that women have to face on their own. I know of some prominent media artists who, you know, when they get invited to participate to a, to a festival, uh, right as an answer, uh, look, I, had, I, just, I just had a look at the program and at the panel and I'm quite uncomfortable. They are 
almost no women. I would like to ask you to redress it, otherwise I cannot, I don't want to attend this panel or this festival. And of course, there is, I mean, I'm not going to give any names, but they are very famous media artists, men, and it's probably easier for them to have this, this kind of position because they are widely recognized and they are very famous. But it's just to say that um, there are some opportunities for men to, to, uh, to make um, organizer festivals, or, um, I don't know, people who commission artworks to uh, communicate the fact that uh, they are a bit uncomfortable with the over-representation of, of men in, in art and technology. Uh, I, I'll just browse over this uh, because I'm sure I'm in a minority here. Uh, I really, I don't understand why any new media art festival, which has the ambition of being critical and looking at society, has systematically to turn into a big rave party at night. But you know, I'm not, I'm not very big on music anyway, so it's just something very personal, and, and I'm sure, as I said, I'm in a minority. Um, yes, um, I have this thing with virtual reality. I really, I mean, I'm usually not that grumpy, I promise you. Um, I'm really not keen on it at all for many reasons, mainly hygienic. But my boyfriend, um, unfortunately or fortunately, because he forces me to open up my mind a bit, but my boyfriend is actually a virtual reality developer. And uh, the observation I have is that, you know, I would go to a festival, whether it's a media art festival or, or traditional contemporary art festival, and all the experiments, I think so far, I'm probably I haven't seen many, but I would say most of the, the artistic experiments I see with virtual reality are just justified by, oh, we want to experiment with the technology, and that's fine, and it's very important. But when, but seen from the perspective of someone who um, gets to see uh, uh, how the game industry is, is using virtual, uh, virtual reality, or how people um, involved in documentary making are using virtual reality. I think um, they are also uh, uh, exploring and experimenting, but they, they seem to add an extra dimension, which is a narrative, uh, um, a level of engagement, of another type of aesthetic. So I think um, uh, experimenting, is, experimenting is fantastic, but um, for, the sake, for the sake of experimenting, I'm, I'm not so sure. But as I said, virtual reality, it's very difficult to sell it to me anyway. But all the, the, the virtual reality projects I saw that I, I, I got really enthusiastic about were in the world of, in, in the context of um, documentary making and, and video, music video. Um, just quickly, I'm sure you all know the work of uh, James, James Bridal. I just want to say that uh, you can do and say and express something really meaningful and important about technology without necessarily using technology. Uh, in, this case, in this case, James Bridal used only paint uh, to carry out an important, I think, an important message about the gaze of the machine, about remote controlled war, wars, and about... Um, all kinds of uh, technologies and logics and, and inner working of technologies that are still very opaque to uh, most of us. Yes, um, in, in the future, okay, I'm going in the future and projecting myself in the future, I, my dream would be to see um, people involved in art and technology engage more with the physical materiality of uh, the technology and I'm sure you've seen these images of the way uh, coltan is, is mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo, how it's in the, hand, in the hands of the militia, how well it's not redistributed equally. I'm sure also you've seen this, uh, this photo of the biggest e-waste, or one of the biggest e-waste dump sites in the world. It's in, it's in Ghana, so I'm not uh, going to insist. These photos are about Peter Hugo. Um, um, and uh, so on that backdrop, I think that very often what I see in, in, in media art festivals and exhibitions and conferences is some kind of glorification of technology. And of course, we all like technology, but uh, and, and, and very, I see also very superficial critique. So I was wondering if um, 
yeah, I'm feeling that it would be, it, it would be maybe more productive to uh, embed this, um, this critique more meaningfully into, into artworks and by using discarded material, for example, such as what Paul Grandjean is doing or Benjamin Gollon um, or Catherine Wariwaki and Jonathan uh, and Jonah Brucker Cohen, what, what they've been doing since 2003 with the sc Scrapyard Challenge workshops. Uh, but also to go beyond that and uh, really clearly, like directly engage with the people who are involved in, in making and uh, in extracting all these, these minerals and modifying the, the, the materials and assembling them because very often these people are never directly involved. We have kind of a situation that pains us. We know that people at the other side of the world are suffering because of our addiction to technology. And um, yeah, we kind of document it uh, as writer of art and tech or as, as, as artists and designers and, and you know, raise awareness. Um, whereas the artists such as uh, uh, Lisa Ma with her project a few years ago, Farmification, where she went to a joystick factory and she lived with the worker, she spent time in the dorms with them, she ate with them, she discussed with them and um, she wanted to understand how, you know, when a technology such as the joystick is uh, in about to be to become obsolete, what what happened to the to the people who are building this technology, and how, how are they becoming obsolete as well? And is there is there a way to look at the problem and, and maybe discuss with them and find with them some form of solution? Um, I don't really have a lot of time to discuss the, the project. It's a, I found it very interesting and, and it's also quite complex to uh, explain all its different level. But uh, it's an example of a, of a direct engagement of uh, working together with the community. The, also, this other project, Van Martin Van Einde, who um, he was in um, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And um, so these are all kinds of objects made in, in malachite. And as you can see, it's a beautiful minerals. It's a beautiful mineral. And uh, craftsmen, um, they mostly do little objects for tourists, uh, like uh, little statues of animals or pieces of jewelry. And but what uh, malachite is also used to produce copper. And, and copper is an important component of, of digital electronics. And he realized that uh, many of the people who extract malachite, and it's the same for coltan and, 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 and cobalt and, and other minerals, they actually don't realize, they don't know uh, what they are working for. They don't realize that uh, all these minerals that they're, that they're extracting are going to come back at some point in their country in, in, the, sh in the form of, of e-waste trash. Um, illegally sent to, to uh, Africa, or in the form of mobile phones. So he worked together with, uh, with, the, craft, with the craftsmen and he, he, to kind of define a new type of market and he suggested to them, uh, well, maybe you, you, could, uh, you could try to bridge the gap between uh, the origin of the mineral and what it's going to be used for and make this uh, these really simple sculpture of the most iconic, um, most iconic, uh, uh, pieces of electronic. Um, so it's an example of working with, the, he also work with uh, a local artist on another project on a similar theme. Uh, yes, um, the other thing I'd like to mention is that I realize as uh, artists, curators and critics, uh, we, we function uh, we, we, um, in inside a specific context. We work with, with people who commission artwork and who pay for, for us to exhibit it or who, who fund our project. Um, but I think um, it, it would be really important or it would be really helpful if the critique was coming from inside. If um, I'm going to give an example that maybe what I'm trying to say is going to be clearer. But I saw many examples in the world of traditional contemporary art where um, where the artist really wanted to engage people who are not, what would not otherwise come into, um, into uh, art exhibition. And there are lots of people in the streets of Geneva who would really benefit from, from hearing you talk or seeing your work, but they just don't, maybe they, are, they, are, they don't know this festival exists or they don't realize it's a reality that, that um, 
that should concern them. Um, so there are lots of, like, really quite a few examples from the traditional world of contemporary art where the artist kind of hack the uh, artistic institution and get these unusual suspects, these other types of public inside the debate and, and, and have them participate and dialogue directly instead of, you know, working in this little echo chamber where you preach to the converted. So an example is the one of Fernando um, Garcia Dori, who's an artist and rural activist. And he was invited to the Freeze Art Fair. Um, and he gave the stand to a representative of um, uh, the Farmers Union from Wales. Uh, and it was called the Angry Farmer, Farmer's Milk bar, bar. It was actually not angry, the people were not angry at all, but uh, they, they used the opportunity as a platform to discuss with the public and talk about the fact uh, that they really struggle to survive, that uh, the, the price that supermarkets are paying them for milk is really not helping them make a living. And uh, they really got a platform to voice their concern and, and their and, and their problems, and, and really enter into a dialogue with, with visitors. Uh, I'm, I'm going to mention quickly also my favorite artist in the whole universe, together with Jeremy Deller. So, uh, Nouria Guel operates mostly in the context of the financial crisis in, 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 in Spain, and uh, she wants to help people who have been victims of, uh, well, of this financial crisis, people who have problems with uh, paying their mortgage, people who uh, are, are really affected by the dismantling of public service, people who are suffering from the, what she calls the theft of the commons uh, in the hands of the, of the banks and, and of the state. And she wants to really offer some practical uh, solutions to these people. So she organized, uh, I think the photos are from Barcelona. Uh, she set up this little uh, office inside, inside the gallery space where people could come and get some, uh, an, they could get an appointment and, and talk about their financial problem and, and get some uh, legal advices on, on about the way to pay their taxes or, or, or ways to solve their particular problem. And uh, the way she reached out to these people is, is with this kind of grassroots uh, protest uh, posters, which she wrote in, in Catalan, um, that, that are really simple and not the kind you you would associate uh, art poster to, to be like. And that's how, that's how she get inside. She was using the structure of, of contemporary art to uh, give something back to the community. Um, I don't have the time to talk about Fred, Fred Wilson's hacking of a fairly racist museum. It's one, yeah, I really love that, this artwork. Um, but I tend to be very, very long. I wanted to mention, I actually don't know, I don't know, uh, or I'm not remembering many media artists who have been criticizing and, and subverting and hacking from the, from the inside um, media art institution. The only example I could think of is uh, the fantastic Niklas Roy with his uh, uh, spoof project, uh, Water in Africa, Water in Austria. Uh, which he did for Ars Electronica. And uh, yes, uh, I think by now I've offended pretty much everybody in this room, but there is uh, some <laughs> someone missing, and it's people like me. It's the bloggers, it's the writer, it's the critic, and it's the people writing about digital art or new media art. And I think uh, we need to, to talk about the state of art criticize of art criticism in media art and in digital art because I feel we tend to be very complacent. Um, and of course, there's some fantastic uh, art critique in the world of digital art. I'm thinking of Domenico Quaranta and, and of others. But most of the time, you know, when, when you have a look at, at blogs uh, or online magazines that are presenting digital artwork, it's extremely enthusiastic which is fantastic. Most of the time I'm very enthusiastic, believe me. But um, it's also very superficial. The discussion stops at how does it work and how fun it is. And um, I think it's a bit limited as a, as a discussion. And if I, if I have to turn the mirror onto, onto myself, I would say that I'm probably very, very guilty of this kind of, of tendency because 
I don't, I don't exactly, I don't have a lot of time to dedicate to my blog, and so I tend to write only about the artworks that I, that I really love, uh, which, I mean, if, if readers follow my blog, they might think, oh, I'm, I'm the ever enthusiastic puppy uh, writing uncritically about, about media art and digital art, but I think it's time we, we we maybe stop and, and try and define different criteria and maybe vocabulary and language to talk about about media art. Um, I don't know, yeah, I'll stop here. Um, the, the last thing is I want to say is that I don't think everybody is, is uh, I'm not attacking everybody. They are fantastic examples of, of festivals that are very critical and I really try to engage directly with the community affected and, and with specific topics. Um, I haven't seen uh, yet the exhibition of uh, upstairs, I think, this novation, but from what I know, of the work of Maria and, and Nicola and their gang, they tend to be very critical and, and look at our uh, fascination for so-called progress and innovation with a very um, critical uh, voice. So um, that's it for me. Thanks, thanks for not lynching me at the end <laughs> of the panel. Um, next up, we have Sabine. Yes, hello everybody from my side. I also uh, took the opportunity when I was invited to this panel to focus on one particular question or issue. And I'm speaking here from the vantage point as director of HEC, House of Electronic Arts in Basel. And uh, one of the questions that I wanted to focus on is uh, what can an art institution, where, why, does it need an arts institution focused on media arts today? And what can we do uh, to promote digital art, to mediate it, to reach a wider audience, and also to integrate it into the canon of contemporary art? Um, I'm doing that by showing three main trajectories, presenting, mediating, and collecting digital art within the work at HEC. Um, through that, we engage in addressing and shaping the public understanding of the social and political complexities of art and media technologies to foster dialogue on the changes that media technologies have on society and how digital art reflects on these changes and gives us new perspective and hopefully alternative models. In our exhibition program, we address current topics of our information society. Today, I want to present three exhibitions from this year that address the potential of new technologies and the impact of media technologies on society at large. And because um, uh, Regine has uh, uh, mentioned that as well, I also want to say that our understanding of media art at HEC is also a very broad one. So it's not only art that uses technology, but that reflects on the impact of technology on society. For example, last year we had a show by the young American artist Adi Wagenknecht, and I had some guided tools where people were saying, so in that show, I think every, everything that was there was reflecting how the internet has changed society. But it was physical objects, sculptures, and even paintings. And a lot of people were saying to me, yeah, but this is not uh, electronic art. I wonder why you're doing this show. But I think it's important uh, to cross that boundaries. The first, exhibition, the first exhibition that I want to mention is The Unframed World, curated by Tina Sauerländer, a young curator from Berlin, focusing on VR. <laughs> 
And uh, what interests us by uh, staging that show was, on the one hand, uh, that new, me new medium that was talked about all over in the media, but from a perspective of an art institution, how VR can be shown in an exhibition context, not just hanging uh, nine VR goggles from the ceiling, but how, uh, how uh, people can have an experience. So every work that we showed had a physical representation. The first example here is by Rachel Rosen, an artist from New York. What you see here is a video projection and uh, paintings. So she comes really from a painting uh, background. And then the VR world where some of the imagery that is uh, seen in her paintings is reflected in the work uh, as well. Another important issue was to show different approaches. So from high-end products as the HTC Vive to the modestly priced uh, Google Cardboard tools that were used. So virtual reality means experiencing works of art instead of merely viewing them. So that's also the problem that we have here. In virtual reality, there's no distance anymore. The virtual world er uh, evolves around the spectator. And it was interesting to see, I'm not sure if I have brought any images. It was really interesting to see how it was important in the exhibition to mediate for a lot of visitors. Actually, we had a lot of uh, visitors over 60 years old to understand how it works. You know, we needed to have uh, guidance within the show and uh, for people to enable them to experience the technology. When, what I found interesting that uh, VR could be experienced as a metamedia with uh, extended different artistic practices into the digital space. From paintings, as you can, from painting, as you can see here, to performance or sculpture. Virtual worlds of images and real space were entangled with the work's physical manifestations and uh, were referencing each other. Again, a, an, an aspect why VR in the exhibition context was important for us. VR is often described as an empathy machine, as this allows one to dive directly into action. Here the art acts more as a critique enabling entity, I find. The works presented in the exhibition are not about an empath empathic experience, but instead about a social feedback showing how the new medium has fundamentally changed our sense of space and time, social, private and public life, and the relationship between the artist and user. So here, uh, again, uh, an image from Rachel Rose, Just a Nose. I'm just showing three examples. Melody Musi, an artist from uh, Geneva, and it's her second VR piece called uh, Hannah Hannah. It was an interactive work where you used uh, the pointer to grow arms in this desert-like environment, which was also followed by uh, very disturbing sounds. And uh, her work was also interesting because it was the, basically the only one where the viewer had a bodily representation. When, you, when one was looking down, it felt like uh, some kind of a bloodstream, like red particles that were the viewer's body. And another piece by uh, the Lausanne-based design group Fragment, Fragmentin, uh, 2199, an interesting piece in that respect that it allowed uh, interaction of three visitors with the work. And the piece was, the world itself was very abstract, so it was just white with some texts and some uh, graphical elements in it. And it was really asking the question, who is manipulating whom? Is it the machine or the human who uh, defines the interaction of the work? And here again, uh, yeah, two examples of you know the importance of mediating the projects, helping people to understand how it works. Another example is to show how much of this is fiction that has been shown uh, till last Sunday. Actually, the show is a collaboration between uh, several international partners: Framer Framed in Amsterdam, Fact in Liverpool, and Hack in Basel. 
has been curated by Annette Decker and David Garcia and focused on the topic of tactical media, a term that has been coined by David Garcia together with Jad Loving end of the 90s. The term tactical media refers to the tactical use of media to uncover and decode social power structures using the hoax or trick. However, due to the political developments of last year, the question soon asked itself, what is the role of tactical media in the age of Trump, Brexit and fake news? Where are the possibilities for artistic disturbances, interventions, simulations and detournements when Facebook and Google are increasingly controlling the flow of information in the global networks and are captured in ever more complex and intrusive surveillance systems? Where is the power today and what tactics and media do artists and activists use when the strategy of fiction as a method has now been taken over by politicians who simply assert reality and trust it to become as, as uh, claimed in the end? The works in the exhibition follow these questions. We presented artistic positions that operate with two central strategies. The first one is to fictionali fictionalize our reality in the sense of what if. The second strategy asserts an alternative reality in the sense of as if. The artistic projects thus use strategies are, that are now used also by politics, but they are never used to justify a claim to power, but always to uncover existing uh, machinist structure. Their goal is to encourage us to think and act and not to leave our reality to others. And I show some images of the show. The show was divided into two sections. The first one was called Guantanamo Bay Museum of Art and History, which is the name of an artwork by American artist Ian Allen Paul, which is a website and also promotional video that could be seen in the exhibition space. So all the other projects in that uh, black covered area are part of the Guantanamo Bay Museum of Art and History. And what you see here, uh, the white section which was the newsroom which featured works that actually took place in the media itself. And also just uh, three examples to give you an overview on the um, potential of works. The project Son Antedi by the Swiss group uh, Christoph Wachter and Matthias Jude, which is a recreation of the prison camp of Guantanamo, a project that they started in 2006. And they took all the images they found on Guantanamo and reconstructed that world in a 3D environment. So as you can see here, you had the joystick to uh, walk through the space in the 3D. Uh, environment but you also had the website next to it and could click to various places where they have found material. Another project is by Moreshin Alayari, Mater Material Speculation ISIS, um, that a, a work that she started, you probably all have seen this uh, video that went viral on social media of ISIS destroying uh, cultural artifacts at the Mosul Museum in Iraq. For her, that was a starting point to think of, you know, memory cultures and how this information about our cultural history can be preserved and can be shared. Because it's also a criticism to say, probably you've heard of projects like Palmyra 2.0, where Google and other big companies are reprinting uh, cultural artifacts and repositioning them in a total different context, for example, uh, at a square in London. So she reprinted those, uh, some of those artifacts in, with a 3D printer in a smaller format. And you see also the printer that is uh, printing another one of the uh, artifacts. But when you look closely again, and I think you can see it in the bottom, Incorporated in those sculptures are uh, flash drives with all the information that she found on these materials. So PDFs, uh, video files, documentation on the materiality of the object and so on. And what she does is that she online is releasing that material 
so for everybody to have sort of kind of sharing and spreading the information and enabling everybody to take care of that history. And the last project from that exhibition is uh, a video project called The Drone Aviary by the British Indian uh, group Superflux. And uh, here you see they have done a poster where you see several drones and their functionalities that actually have also been built by them. And then a video where they work together with a science fiction author to envision uh, a scenario of the future, so that would be the uh, what-if scenario where we can see a potential future where our streets are controlled and our li lives are controlled and guarded by, by drones. The last example regarding uh, exhibition programs is uh, an exhibition called Unreal, the Algorithmic Present that will be shown at HEC during that summer. The exhibition examines the complexity of our time as the separation between the digital and the real has become obsolete. It presents works that illustrate the often hidden materiality of the bits and bytes. With the help of 24 works by international artists, algorithmic processes of our digital present, presence are physically experienced in poetic installations and immersive projections. By revealing the mechanisms and means of digital processes that, that constitute our present experience of reality, the works unified in the exhibition show us the new logic of the real. They excite our senses and stimulate our perception. They point to the effectiveness of digital devices with which we entrust our data and make our memories. At the same time, the work, work's question, who has the right to own this new reality manifested in the materiality of the bits and bytes and the algorithmic performance of the digital. Here, one example by uh, Ralph Becker, who has also been presented by Nicola Nova earlier this morning. Uh, the project Mirage is a synthetic landscape which is uh, based on the Earth-changing magnetic fields. So he has a connection to that data and manifested within this virtual landscape that is constantly shifting. What's interesting is that he is uh, sort of building an analog computer and visualizing algorithmic processes with different means. Another example here by Daniel Kanoga called Small Data. It's a series of uh, projections where he shows us, you know, broken older devices like, I don't know, D DVD drives, mobile phones, old com uh, computer uh, tablets and so on, and all the memories that we entrust on onto the machines and that also might be lost. Another piece by the Swiss artist Sarah Punavala, The Fool's Ballad, an interactive work uh, where you can experience the volume of sound and this uh, loudspeaker is reacting to the movement of the visitors within the exhibition space. And the last example by Kerstin Ergensinger called Wanderer, uh, small thermal printers that create a drawing on this uh, uh, thermal paper over the course of the exhibition. So it's pre-programmed and uh, exactly when the exhibition ends, then the drawing will be finished. My next part is education and mediation. HEC sees itself as a place for discussion and as an experimental field in which media education and media reflection are carried out. An essential part of the activities is therefore the education program, which is designed as an independent and not as a mere supplement to the exhibition activities. Objectives of the education programs are learning commun communicatively by participating in creative, aesthetic, and technological processes, and thus media mediating conceptual and formal knowledge. We would like to promote a dialogical and active exploration of contents, themes, and works of exhibitions in a theoretical but also in a practical way, and also, of course, in direct collaboration with artists. 
Mediation is understood as production of meaning and as communication. We try to create an awareness of media technologies that we are using in our daily lives and a self-determined use that goes beyond the use of these uh, uh, tools as con pure consumer goods. One very important example, Critical Make, which was a festival uh, format with an exhibition, workshops, performances, and talks. In the, middle, in the middle of the exhibition space, we had the platform, a stage, which was constantly activated by presentations, by workshops and performances. The theme of Critical Make was the question of self-making as a means of learning, exchange and cultural production. We asked questions like what are artists doing and what is the role of the spectator? Therefore, doing and production from the side of the artists as well as the visitors were a central point. Another example, the internet, Yami Ichi, an internet flea market that took place at HEC uh, in April, where goods and servi services related to the internet were offered for sale, which was also embracing uh, amateur production, so everybody was invited, but there was an open call uh, for people to bring uh, their handmade material that relates to the internet. Then just two examples for workshops. Uh, we are doing uh, painting with drones by uh, American artist Adi Wagenknecht, which had quite a playful character. And here another example, the Kill Your Phone workshop that has been conceived by Aaron Bartol, which is a permanent workshop we are doing where visitors are invited to sue their own little pockets for mobile phones when the phone is then completely uh, safe from surveillance because it's these metal threads in the material that are disconnecting the phone. And here just some more example to see uh, uh, that we are trying to reach out for younger and senior citizens, so really a broad focus on our workshop program. Then, of course, also in the area of communication, activating the visitor means uh, also to engage them as producers. And here uh, you see an image from our website that includes user content in the image of the institution so that we are happy to give that a new field. The digital media of the present are, above all, media of communication. Whoever takes part in it is no longer the recipient of information, but works with the content in the form of the social net. This continual productive activity of many participants creates new cultural forms through social media. And of course, these fundamental upheavals in the field of the media also affect societal and political conditions. For us, digital media are not primarily interesting as techniques, but above all as places and platforms of participatory cultural forms and practices, which is the focal point of our educational program and concept. And we take this as a vantage point for connecting technological, social and artistic questions. Then my last point to mention is the strategy of collecting to not least inscribe digital art into an art history context. Hack Collection's main focus is on born digital art and here specifically on software and net-based artistic practice. Just showing a couple of examples. Mark Lee, uh, an online work where he connects two online feeds, uh, Instagram images with the hashtag me that are then in real time connecting the geolocation data. Two examples. Another piece by Beat Brugler, One Word Movie from 2003, where you type in uh, a search term and then it collects images uh, from Google and combines them to, uh, uh, to a movie. Or here, uh, uh, eToy Art Group and all their projects that they combined in a history for us that's now part of our collection or here also an older work from 2000, Trace Noiser by the group LAN. Curator Christiane Paul points out, quote, 
for decades the relationship between digital art and the mainstream art world and institution has been notoriously uneasy, end quote. Joanna Phillips, conservator of the Guggenheim Museum in New York, stated during the third Tech Focus Conference at the museum that the Guggenheim collection includes only 22 software-based artworks, which is the equivalent of 2.0% of the total collection. By collecting, we try to work against that neglected chance in digital, in digital art in collections. And maybe one last thing to mention is also um, when we go back to this piece uh, by Beat Brugler from 2003, when the artist approached us, it was actually a donation, the work didn't function anymore. Because the API connection by, uh, uh, by Google has been more and more restricted. So of course I see it also in our competence as a museum to support the artist and to keep that work for future generations. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, fair warning, I had about an hour of sleep last night, so uh, I might just talk myself to sleep. Um, also, um, thank you very much for the, uh, for the great two talks that we just saw. Um, uh, the people that were offended by uh, Regine's talk, um, um, I think I can make you happy again <laughs> to some degree. Um, um, so yeah, uh, first of all, thanks uh, to the festival, thanks to Carmen, thanks to Nora. Uh, for having me, uh, and um, I'm also uh, really excited to be at the festival. I'm actually also staying until Sunday because uh, I really want to see everything of it because um, I always wanted to go and I've never been, and I actually just remembered the other day that I wanted to go to the first edition of the festival back when it was still a VJ festival, and I was really into VJing back in 2005. Um, and I also included this little... Uh, uh, artifact um, because uh, it's a nice little reminder of how uh, DIY cultural cultural in infrastructures can grow out of niche communities um, that are organized around certain practices or around certain tools and uh, and how the how these infrastructures can mature into quite capable platforms for uh, discourse um, and conversations broader conversations um, and there are other examples of that. I mean, uh, many of you will probably uh, know Node Festival that has grown out of the V4 community, which is a tool for visual programming. And um, and you know, initially these people just wanted to gather, and uh, and talk. And out of that uh, grew a festival that now has a, um, a major exhibition and uh, invites artists from all over the world, and is really uh, uh, also a forum for digital art. Uh, Fiber Festival also. Um, uh, grew out of uh, essentially creative coding uh, meetups, so uh, it's interesting to see how uh, how these um, these festivals have kind of bloss blossomed uh, in between the cracks of uh, est established institutional networks, and uh, you know where they address um, a need for discussion and exchange, which might be relevant to 
the things that we we're going to talk about in the panel. So I'm going to say we a lot. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to my team because it's not just me. Um, um, so uh, yeah, we are an international team of four um, from left to right. There's Greg Smith, myself, Sherry Kennedy, and Philip Wisnich, and we're based in Toronto, Berlin, uh, and London. Um, and this is actually one of the few times that we actually got together. Um, uh, this was the, the launch of the first issue of Holo Magazine at IBM in, in New York. Um, um, so when, when we don't have opportunities like that, launching a magazine or um, uh, meeting at festivals, we actually just uh, you know um, hang out in the chat window all day and talk to each other about digital art, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, Right, so we kind of like, we, we do a lot of different things and, and we kind of use the umbrella term or the umbrella name uh, of Creative Applications Network for, for the things that we do and we kind of figure things out, you know, as we go along. Um, so whatever we do, kind of like this is kind of the first kind of the hub where we kind of pin, pin it to. Um, so what is Creative Applications Network? Uh, I think some of you... Uh, are familiar with the blog that we run, which is kind of a blog and an online archive of projects. Then we publish a, a printed magazine called Holo. Um, we uh, produce, curate, uh, and contribute programming to uh, festivals and events. And then we do a whole bunch of special projects. I'm just going to grab a random water. Um, together with um, partnering institutions, organizations, um, yeah, and this kind of like we realized over the years that these like four different things are our way of thinking about this stuff, you know, digital art, digital culture, and, and how we disseminate these things and, and, and how these things become. I should have a sip first. And how these different platforms are kind of like ways of research for us. And, um, and at the core of what we're interested in is um, kind of the relationship between these three different fields. It's totally a thing now, I know. Um, but um, we're kind of, we're kind of in, 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 a, in a similar situation or position uh, uh, that Regine is in, in the way that we don't really consider ourselves experts in digital art, but rather observers. And, and, and we are interested in, um, you know, in, convergence, in convergences, in disciplinary fringes, and in overlaps and intersections. Um, so the, the dynamics at the intersection of art, science, and technology is kind of what is uh, of interest to us. And you know, transdiscipl transdisciplinary practice and, and, and thinking of uh, art and design as ways of re research. Um, and these things have always been in relation to one another and always like pushing and, and, and pulling. And um, it's, it's you know, needless to say, um, um, it is technology that kind of mediates these, these disciplines more and creates kind of exchanges and conversations between different fields. Um, yeah, and we are particularly interested in how tools, material, materials, and methodologies shape creative practice. You know, especially when tools are openly shared and, and when they're actually collectively created. You know, who's, who's the author of the work? You know, if you, if you use an algorithm that is 60 years old, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, like, you know, tools that are in constant flux, that is, uh, that is interesting to us. And the role of the artist as kind of a tool maker and an inventor and an engineer. And um, this way of looking at artists is, uh, of course, nothing new. Um, this long tradition of artists making their own tools to kind of aid their creative practice and, um, and, and using new technologies, new, using new mediums, exploring them and, uh, and making up their own kind of pipelines and, uh, uh, you know, wake of, ways of working. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I need to go through these because many people, uh, most of you will be familiar with those. So, um, and, and when we have... You know, t technology today. I mean, for I'm just going to cite one example because um, um, uh, Inatovic's uh, a sensor. This is a kind of a, a sensor la a laden uh, cybernetic uh, sculpture from the from the 1970s. Um, it would respond to sound, and you know, in, and obviously, uh, decades ago, very few people were able to actually explore technology that was uh, as powerful as that. And today, uh, you know, this is something that we can all do. And that's why we see uh, such a surge of uh, interdisciplinary projects that don't really fall into, you know, categories, or it's difficult to put them into particular boxes. And um, um, you know, in some uh, four projects that kind of stick with me, stick with us, um, 
are, uh, for example, Light Barrier by Kimchi and Chips, and uh, the third iteration just yesterday, I think, got a, a distinction award from Ars Electronica. It's kind of a, um, um, it's a volumetric display, if you will, um, and so they had two projectors that were manipulated, and they were able to control the projection in a way that they could guide every single pixel um, towards curved mirrors, and then um, control the reflections. So in the end, you got these these ghostly three-dimensional apparitions of light, you know, that were moving and being animated. Um, the other example is David's Rally Mountain, um, and um, it's essentially it's kind of a video game, but it's also not a video game in the way that uh, the only way of interacting with it is that you can just look at it. Um, and um, this one is also uh, kind of neat. Um, it's um, Satelliten by uh, a Berlin-based uh, studio, uh, Quadratur. And what it does is it's just a little drawing machine that essentially is hooked up to GPS data. So whenever a, a satellite flies above, you know, it draws a line uh, on an actual map. And, uh, and then on the bottom right, there's... Um, what's his face again? Um, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Benedict Gross, of course. Um, he uh, c uh, had this project, um, I think in 2013, where he created these, these algorithmic uh, or procedural crop layouts, um, and he really got uh, uh, researched um, uh, modern agricultural machines in the way that they, uh, most of them operate actually via GPS, so they're kind of remote controlled, so nobody has to drive these, these machines anymore. And so he essentially built an interface and, and uh, designed an algorithm to, to lay out crops in a way that is more environmentally efficient or, or beneficial, more uh, uh, efficient for the plants and for the, for the crops that are to be harvested. And so it's, um, so it's kind of a design project, it's a research project, and you know, some might call it land art, I don't know. So stuff like that is really interesting for us. Another example, uh, Jörg Lenny's um, uh, drawing machines. Um, that are very, very physical, tangible, and in the real world. So, and he, c he essentially created both the software and the hardware for them. And, and um, you know, while he always talks about his works as tools that are meant to be used, you know, they're also, you know, uh, uh, part of museum collections and uh, uh, treated and talked about as, as works of art. And, and then uh, this project came up before today. Uh, and Nicholas had it uh, included in his slides. It's quite new. It's currently uh, at Gnome Gallery in Berlin. And uh, James Beidel also, deservedly so, came up a number of times. And uh, yeah, the autonomous, uh, autonomous trap, um, it was talked about before. So it's essentially um, uh, James uh, kind of trapped an, um, an autonomous uh, autonomous vehicle inside a um, kind of a magic salt, salt circle. And, and what's interesting is, um, I mean, it's a, it's a thoughtful project. It's, it's, uh, even though the thing does not actually work, it's more of kind of like a gesture. It's kind of a concept. Um, and, but what's interesting is that he, you know, he built the autonomous vehicle himself. He developed um, um, the software for it, and he, he built like some custom sensors, et cetera, et cetera, because he really, to, he really to wanted to understand the technology. And I quote from Rugin's blog, because she interviewed him in part of the project, and I thought that one, um, one answer kind of speaks quite well to the way we look at these things, or where we are coming from. And he said, um, I think it's incredibly important to understand the medium you're working with, which in many cases, which in my case was machine vision and uh, machine intelligence as applied to a self-driving car, something that makes its own way in the world. By understanding the materiality of the medium, you really get a sense of a much wider range of uh, possibilities for it, something you will never do with someone else's machine. So yeah, again, the artist as a, as a researcher and, and, and looking at art and design as ways of research um, and thinking about technology as a, um, um, as a tool and a medium and a collaborator that you can both explore and also question and uh, critically engage. Um, so yeah, so now, now how, how do we, you know, how do we um, engage uh, with, with these things? Um, you know, one way is, is the blog. This is kind of a um, blog in a way that we, it's really just a, an archive, it's where we collect projects and where we break them down, unpack them, you know, kind of tell our readers how, how they work, how they function. It's not so much a place where we um, 
critique work or review work. We do that sometimes with gallery shows and stuff, but uh, mostly, for the most part, it's really just an archive where um, that is useful for students, for universities, where they can look up projects and also see how pro projects are positioned in relation to other projects, you know, that use similar tools. Um, and, um, yeah, I think uh, just some numbers, about uh, uh, 150,000 people read the blog every month. And, um, yeah, and I think over the years we've cultivated quite an, uh, a loyal and, uh, and active community around the blog. Many, uh, many uh, people who are uh, active practitioners themselves. Yeah, and again, it's really important for us to reveal the, uh, the tools and the processes uh, that go into these projects and break them down. And, um, and so... so if we have a mandate, then it's definitely an educational one. Um, and an educational mandate quite easily translates um, into events, you know, where you bring people that you find interesting, people that do interesting work, and also people that want to learn about that stuff together um, through, uh, you know, lecture formats, um, uh, workshops, et cetera, et cetera, which is also very, very common now. Um, and we're not so much, we never frame these, these festivals as art festivals um, and we're quite careful to you know to con not fall into that category because we're really about um, you know people that are hybrids as Golan Levin uh, uh, told uh, said about uh, the visitors visitors of resonate which is a festival that we kind of um, developed for the first three years um, yeah, um, and, and the events that we do, they kind of scale in uh, opposite directions. Uh, the biggest thing that we've uh, done so far was ACT Festival in 2015 at uh, ACT Center in Gwangju, South Korea. Um, so it was a major exhibition part of that, which was interesting also because the people that exhibited work also hosted workshops. So the students and the people that attended, you know, that could actually l l learn from the, peoples, from the people whose works they saw in the exhibition. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, um, people get when you, when, you, when you run a blog and you have an audience that you do events to, to bring people together so they can learn face-to-face. -face. Another transition that we m made was not as obvious and not as seamless at uh, first sight. Um, and, um, and that was the decision to make a, a magazine, a print magazine that had people scratching their head a little bit. And um, obviously, you know, because old media, these, these ideas about old media, what is old, what is new, it's all relative. And, um, but the, the idea to, to make a magazine kind of came out of our thinking about how we engage with, you know, our content and with our audience um, on the web. And to be quite honest, uh, we've been struggling with that for, for a number of years now. Because um, if you, you know, if you, this is how we typically learn about new projects, um, and um, and how many of us will ever really see them, because you know very few are actually privileged enough to you know to go to festivals, to to go to exhibitions, to see works, you know, in, in the way they're actually meant to be seen. Um, so all that we get, and this kind of speaks a little bit to what Regine was telling earlier, is essentially superficial, um, just kind of n and slightly polished um, artist statements, if you will, and, um, and you, you see the same images, the same videos, and this is also kind of an, um, um, speaks to the, to, the, uh, to the life expectancy um, of, um, of a project online. You know, it's like there's a blog that writes about it first and like within hours, you know, it kind of it trickles through uh, other major blogs and then, like after two two weeks or so, it's kind of dead. Nobody talks about it anymore because everybody's so eager to move on to the next project, and especially, um, you know, and it's gotten really uh, worse the more these kinds of works have been picked up by uh, by the mainstream and became interesting. And and you know, big blocks, you know, they have their daily quarters. They need to. Cr crack out content, so they essentially just become publicists for, for artists. And artists are also to blame for that relationship because, um, you know, like any press is good press and uh, they're not interested in developing relationships with, with writers or with like, certain outlets. And um, so, yeah, that's kind of how, how these things happen. Um, yeah, and, uh, yeah, and these shots were taken just within a few days from each other, so 
that's kind of how things happen, how we consume the stuff online. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, there are also obvious other problems, you know, the linearity of the web, like everything is geared towards what's new, what's latest. Um, the, fr the fragility of online content, you know, and, and to be quite honest, um, our own old content ages rather badly. You know, if you look up really early uh, posts, you know, they kind of, they look horrible. Um, and, uh, and the services that we used to rely on, they've shut down. And uh, I think uh, the average life expectancy for URL is about 100 days. So, you know, these, these are obviously problems of an ephemeral medium. And then also we realize that we've kind of, we've cultivated a little bubble that we found ourselves in, you know, from people that are really into that stuff that come to the festivals and that talk in kind of like tech lingo and media art lingo. And, um, but it's really difficult to get beyond that. You think you're online and you know, you for the world to see, but it's not like some, uh, communities online sometimes are very isolated places and they rarely uh, intersect. Um, so how do we how, uh, d diversify our audience? How do we break through through that kind of to that bubble to that through that silo? And then obviously the the economics of it. Um, it's for a niche publication like ours. It's um, virtually impossible to make money online and to create, you know, to have a budget to create good content. Um, so um, yeah, so all you can do is really run it as a pet project. So yeah, we kind of wanted to 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 kind of step out of uh, away from the web for for a while, and um, um, or at least for for a particular project. And and the concerns that I've that I've just um, listed, um, we felt a good way to address them was to publish a magazine, to kind of really take a step back and kind of consider the big picture, and not just look at things like project by project, but um, really consider work in the context of history of science. You know, where does the technology come from? Uh, what are other projects that are um, uh, that have inspired this project or, or have inspired this artist? Look at artist um, career trajectories. That has been really cathartic for us. So to kind of to slow down and um, and and by the um, by it being a product and a magazine that people can buy that actually literally bought us time to to uh, um, to research and to create content. Um, what's also nice about the magazine is that. Um, it is a nonlinear framework in the way that pieces of content kind of just sit next to one another and respond to one another without one being older and one being newer. So there's no hierarchy within the magazine. And that is something that you don't really think about until you actually like make a magazine. Um, and that's kind of changes how you approach content, how you develop content. And, um, and in the way of looking at a magazine or at print as just another piece of technology, um, we realize that as an interface, if you look at it as an interface with, with, uh, interface with content and knowledge, it's actually, uh, it works uh, remarkably well. Um, this is uh, the second issue that we launched uh, late, late last year. And um, an important thing, I think one of the starting points was that we wanted to kind of see, rather than the press packs and the polished images of artists' work, we wanted to see the artists themselves. And we wanted to see, you know, where they work and, you know, their machinery, their tools, you know, the prototypes that end up on the sidelines because they never work, you know, all the dirty stuff. That's what we wanted to see and also to foreground and to, sh to show that to the reader. Um, yeah, and also another thing is uh, um, to make it more um, collaborative um, and to have like a filter, you know, that it's not like an artist sends an artist statement and then that goes out into the world. But it's like having a journalist there and a photographer. So you see an artist and an artist's work through somebody's eyes. So it's not just like, even at a festival, when an artist gives a talk, you know, they present a version of themselves that is oftentimes polished. And, um, and, and so it, it was really important for us to get good people in to engage with these people and then tell their stories through their eyes. Right, so yeah, we featured a whole bunch of people um, over the two issues. Um, um, Ryuchi Kurokawa, Semiconductor, uh, Raphael Lozana Hammer, Katie Patterson, Philip Beasley, Tale of Tales, Vera Molnar, um, which I had the uh, pleasure to visit. She's a 93-year-old uh, computer art pioneer. Um, yeah, and, and, and what's also interesting is that um, through the magazine, we kind of, to some degree, uh, were able to diversify our audience in the way that, um, you know, that we 
We hear from people all the time that are totally not out of this world. They've picked up the magazine randomly, uh, randomly at, at a store or saw it online, heard somebody talk about it, and the magazine really uh, achieved what we wanted it to be, kind of become an entry point for people into, into this world and learn about this. And, and the way we engage the content, it's all about accessibility and really open things up and make it transparent and avoid kind of the typical lingua that we, um, you know, and all the buzzwords uh, um, that we encounter in this um, in this field very often, so yeah. Um, so, but it's not only a, a about people; it's also about abstract concepts. It's about uh, broader themes and emergent uh, uh, problems. Um, so, we always have a big research section in the magazine. In the first one, we talked about augmented vision. In the second one, it's all about randomness. It's about seventy pages, and it covers anything from cryptography to quantum computing to the Big Bang. And, uh, and what's really, really cool is the magazine for us, again, it's a vehicle of research and long-term thinking, but it's also a way to, to really work with and hunker down with experts. You know, it's um, you know, really acknowledge, okay, where does my own knowledge end and who do I need to talk to to kind of to fill these gaps? And we talked to quantum uh, uh, um, computing experts and, uh, um, I don't know, software artists who've been in the field very long. Um, and, uh, yeah, we had amazing contributors from futurists to curators to to active practitioners, yeah. So and this is kind of these are just some excerpts from that thematic section. One really cool thing, um, interesting conversation is between software artist Casey Rees and uh, Scott Aronson, a theoretical computer scientist and one of the experts on randomness and quantum computing, and kind of have these two kind of face off and talk about randomness was, was really interesting and things that we always wanted to do but it's like it's not really able on, uh, to do that on the blog and without the context of the section. And uh, this idea of uh, uh, collaboration and bringing in different people that you know do different things well that extends obviously also to the design process and so we, you know, we work with Carsten Schmidt, a uh, computational designer, to kind of um, create uh, the cover of the magazine and he involved our readers, so he got people, you know, go to a website and like do mouse movements and enter uh, numbers until he had a large set of random numbers that he then fed into a genetic uh, programming system and then combined it with a whole, with a whole bunch of other th things to, uh, to, in the end, kind of output these, these noise crystals. And then we have uh, a 12-month timeline that is... Um, uh, augmented by more than 2,000 images that we kind of procedurally distributed chronologically uh, across these four pages. So yeah, yeah, and some other stuff. I think I'm uh, at 24 minutes. I think it's it's time for me to to close. Okay, thank you. Um, also, I just wanted to mention. I, I totally. I think I misread the briefing. Because we had a little exchange, and he was like, "Yeah, just introduce your stuff, and you know, talk." About it. And I was like, oh, "Okay, cool." And uh, now it's like I feel I should have responded more to what we're going to talk about, but maybe that can be fixed in the panel. The point of discussion, I guess. Okay, so I'm going to invite uh, the rest, the uh, other two presenters, up to join us then as well. You can hold on to this one. Oh. Yeah. Um, I have to say that actually I was really excited when you guys actually developed Holo, who actually made me really excited because I. Actually, I love print, and I've had like a very big fan of the magazine as well. So I was actually extremely excited when you decided to bring to bring this because I thought it did actually bring a very different type of engagement and different consideration of the uh, the rapidness in which we kind of encounter digital culture in our day to day. So I thought I really thought that was actually a very useful way of kind of like pausing things and as well. So, I mean, I guess just through the presentations, it's been quite interesting for me as a listener to kind of see and think that there's a lot of overlap in what uh, a lot of your concerns are and kind of going forward and how we're actually kind of mapping out the field. Obviously, Regine, you're talking about diversity and the types of voices that we allow to participate. And then from your uh, perspective, you're also thinking about kind of the types of, um, again, the types of perspectives that are kind of you know, interested in terms of uh, the types of things that you, you're trying to like allow to have to provide a space for as well. 
And obviously one of the biggest things is the, uh, the language that we're using and the types of criticism that we are kind of uh, engaging with and how we're actually kind of facilitating that dialogue then as well. I just wanted to pick up really quickly on kind of like one strand that you kind of very briefly touched and then we'll begin to talk about kind of maybe like audiences and publics and stuff like that. Is it's very um, clear that there is quite a, a crisis when we're thinking about kind of uh, how kind of culture or how the canon of like what digital art is kind of uh, turning out to be is one of the kind of biggest things that is possibly that is kind of directly impacting is the loss and or, or the lack of public funding for artistic activities which is uh, increasingly concerning but you know obviously there's a, a tension to that in lots of different types of um, uh, creative uh, creative European funding for example as well but <coughs> I guess uh, my question is, is that often there's confusion or criticism about the ways in which we as practitioners respond to maybe kind of the scarcity or the lack of funding that allows kind of uh, these types of activities to play, take place. Sometimes when we collaborate with market markets, for example, it can sometimes lead to situations that are a little bit kind of unsavory or a little bit maybe uh, disregard maybe the kind of the history of what kind of came before for example when in 2014 the digital revolution the exhibition opened in the Barbican there was a, an issue and a commotion of online from that like uh, talked about kind of what uh, Google tried to establish this label dev art and obviously that was kind of a uh, great marketing tool but at the same time there was kind of like uh, an outspokenness about or a criticism about kind of the tactical use of this label as a marketing strategy and the and how it kind of disregards kind of histories and as well but then on other hands then uh, you know collaborations with uh, corporations have actually kind of you know been quite interesting as well and one of the things that kind of springs to mind very recently is a project by Zachary Lieberman called Landlines which was in collaboration with the Chrome Experiment which is a really uh, I really enjoy it I think it's a, a really very beautiful um, way of thinking about drawing and a very expanded sense of drawing then as well and you could sit there and you could just play with it for hours so I guess my main question is that I mean, I ask it to everybody, but you know how when we're engaging with kind of market and corporations and the idea or the issue of finance, like how does that really impact in our decision making to go forward? Not just in terms of like what we get to kind of talk about when it comes to thinking about things like trends, but also how does it begin to kind of maybe narrow the scope of uh, the potential of criticism then as well? And I'm asking it to everybody, so I guess I know it's a very big question. <laughs> Yes. Is it on? I think so. Um, <coughs> well, I tried just to. Um, I tried with the examples that I showed. That I think, as a public institution, it's also important to go beyond, you know, market-driven art that is successful anyway and that can be shown, but. For example, with the uh, with the exhibition, how much of this is fiction was really very much about political issues and how they are addressed by artists. And so it's it's a really a, yeah, it's a difficult question. I mean, some artists are super successful, like uh, Rafael Lozano Hemmer or also Ryoichi Ikeda, and others are you know also net based art. It's a it's a different practice, and thankfully there are institutions like ours. We also do commissioning as part of our exhibition programs, residency or so on, that enables these works uh, to be funded. And the situation in Switzerland, I mean, uh, Prohibitia now started again to give uh, work grants for projects, not only media art, but art in general, which is uh, fantastic. Yeah, I guess uh, Regine as well, I mean, it's quite interesting as well to think about kind of how maybe some of those things then can impact on criticism. When you talked, you talked about kind of maybe sometimes that there is a lack of kind of really en engaged criticism with like issues so in instead we end up with kind of blogs full of like really happy reviews of like of projects. So do you think there's a way, how do you think that there's ways to kind of move beyond those things and like how maybe we can maybe slow down kind of our consumption and our, uh, our necessitation for content then as well? Um, I think what we need maybe is an external gaze. I've been um, 
Okay, I've, I've been a member of a jury of a super famous festival of media art, and everybody is from the same field, and everybody, we are just, I mean, media art is, fant is a fantastic community because it's, someone is, everybody is friendly, and I think one of the reasons why I, I never write negative reviews is just, it's not just because I only write to, I only like to write about things that make me happy, but I've, I've done that in the past, and at some point I end up meeting the artist or the designer, and they are such lovely person that I feel, so like, uh, if, like I'm not brave enough to do it. No, but to come back to that festival uh, and, and to media art in general, I really think we need an external gaze, we need, um, you know, when, when we're dealing with the topic, it would be, it would be, interesting, like if the festival has a specific theme, theme it would be interesting to have uh, like uh, maybe an art critic from The Guardian or I don't know, any other art, traditional art magazine, maybe uh, someone like, uh, like Nicola who is more into ethnography or a philosopher, I don't know. I think, like I have the feeling we live in this really very comfortable and very friendly bubble, um, which, um, yeah, it's, it's comfortable and, and I like it. So I, I think for my source, and I, and I want to say I, I like <laughs> creative application. I think it's a fantastic uh, resource and it's among the, the, all the, the, the other uh, blog you were showing before that were repeating the same story again and again, um, like uh, creative applications is the only one I follow. And I wanted to add something to what you said when, um, when you, when you were talking about this repetition and, and all these blogs talking about the same thing, very often, you know, I receive emails from artists and designers and, I, and I'm, I'm, I, I think they, they send it to you and they send it to, uh, I don't remember the name of the other ones. And, and it's, it's really obvious that they send to so many, so many, and they, they say, dear Regine and dear Philippe and everything. And, and each, time, each time I think, oh, this is something for creative applications. I'm not going to write about it. And then a few hours after, it's on creative applications. There you go. What I find interesting is, um, we, yes, we do get the very same emails. And sometimes we get emails like, hey, um, uh, the Creators Project or, uh, I don't know, Fast Company just wrote about my project. I think it might be interesting to you too. Yeah. Like get everything that you that you and we're like okay well, no thanks. Yeah. Um, because and, and this is something that I didn't really touch upon, but um, we are very um, controlled in, in about uh, um, about what we post. So there's a lot of things that we don't post, and sometimes we um, you know we write th something up and, th and then we have an internal sometimes heated discussion, and then we trash the post. Because we're really, we're very, um, um, yeah, we really only write, write when we mean it. Um, and, you know, many of these other bigger blogs, obviously they don't. You know, they're so happy for every bit of content that comes their way. And so, yeah, it's, it's, and that uh, speaks to kind of like, uh, like how artists are oftentimes just not educated in building relationships with, with journalists, with writers, with outlets. They're just like, okay, I'm done with my project, now I'm going to send it to everybody. Well, I, I, I had an example where I'm sure you know Thomas Twaits, the guy who made yeah. the, the toaster from scratch and who wanted to become a goat. Um, and he's a very good friend of mine. Um, and one day he wrote me, and, and his, like, his, his goat story had been absolutely everywhere in the most mainstream, like, on TV and everywhere. And he wrote me and he said, uh, Regine, do you think you could write about, about my, my project? And I said, well, you know, uh, I don't think there's anyone left on this um, web, web reading planet who's not aware of your project. And he said, well, I feel there is, there is a need of uh, like a more artistic or more critical perspective and could we talk about it? I, I ended up like thinking too much about it and I never wrote about it and I, I feel very, very bad towards, towards Thomas. But uh, yeah, that's true what you say. It's, there's a lot of repetition. Uh, and I'm not sure I answered your question, actually. Okay. <laughs> uh, I guess like, uh, it's important, though, as well, to think about hopefully the fact that... Um, oh, it's okay. I think everybody can hear me, I hope. Uh, 
uh, that there is definitely a, a need for kind of like diversifying and for kind of maybe shifting the field just a little bit more than as well. And I think it's uh, really interesting what you guys are thinking about, especially in, uh, in your institution, because it's quite exciting the way that you're experimenting with uh, preservation and you're also experimenting with displays. When you were rec recalling that, I recounted a, an interview that I was attending for a, a, a museum, and they asked me about uh, displaying interactive and digital work. And... Uh, you know, their question to me was that, well, we have a format by which we, you know, present work continuously in our space. And I guess I answered the question by asking them, but why would you not experiment with maybe some of those formats and what an audience can bring then as well? I didn't get the job. But um, I guess uh, it is really important to think about kind of audience participation in this because this is one of the kind of the key things about kind of technology, about what it affords and what it kind of uh, encompasses as well, is this idea of audience participation. So I guess uh, one of the kind of key questions I have, because it does relate to kind of like how we're defining and how we're shaping the field, but really how does audience participation in these kind of senses, then not even just in terms of like an audience and a public, but also audience and the idea of artists as well. How might we actually kind of translate that into something a little bit more meaningful and how might we sustain that? When you think about how all of our conversation, our dialogue has been very much about kind of histories and, you know, trying to kind of really reflect and consider about some of these things as well. It's like, how are we going to actually maybe draw and think about our audiences and kind of the types of ways in which participation can actually be encompassed or be kind of defined within kind of like the idea of a canon as well? <coughs> well, as I have mentioned, I think there are uh, two important issues. One is that learning also takes place through doing, so it's not just a theoretical reflection, but, you know, gaining knowledge through practically doing stuff, so that's the importance of the workshop program uh, at HEC. And then is to never think you know that everything is forgiven and to also bring in external experts with a different view on what we are doing for example we established a program that's um, a guided tour with external experts who have not seen the exhibition before for example we had uh, Dirk Helbing from ETH, uh, ETH the complexity uh, researcher we had someone from uh, um, from uh, an, a political NGO and so on, and they walk in an exhibition and explain it the way they conceive it. And I think we have to be open to allow that, that it's not just you know our understanding is the one that counts. And for example, uh, on the opening of that show, How Much of This is Fiction, I was also making a reference towards you know how these former artistic tools of fiction as a method you know, that have started with the tactical media uh, movement in the 90s have now been incorporated by the alt-right movement, for example, in the US. So they are, you know, using the social media to, the, to their advantage. And I was talking about meme culture. And then I did a guided tour in the exhibition and a, a young couple in the middle of their 20s asked me what memes are. So we really should not always think that we are all in like this... Yeah, as you said, this get out of the bubble to think that everybody has the same um, knowledge as we do. Yeah. yeah. And how would you how what kind of strategies then do you deal with kind of when dealing with kind of things that are outside or like anything that is kind of maybe discordant or maybe just subversive in some ways? So I mean how might you kind of like deal with maybe some issues that are important like that. So, for example, in Regine in your presentation you talked about the kiss my arse the Twitter hashtag. Um, which did relate, raise quite an awful lot of dialogue and allowed them to kind of really reflect on kind of like their roles and their responsibilities as uh, an institution then as well. And I think it maybe did shift maybe, or at least I hope that it, it seemed like it shifted or it created maybe an internal discussion at least, which I think is really important as well. Because even though that maybe organisations and institutions like that, they can't take the risk in terms of kind of like taking risks in terms of like the, um, saying kind of maybe things that maybe, or saying things that maybe are a little bit kind of risky sometimes, but maybe that it, it's, it's still useful to know that, the, that internally that those discussions are taking place then as well. 
So is there like particular kind of strategies that like, or particular things that you've kind of encountered in your own practices that made you kind of rethink or made you rethink about kind of like how maybe subversive issues should be maybe or should be kind of dealt with, especially when you're thinking about kind of like broader histories or kind of public records of like, of canons of, of digital culture then as well. Maybe just one more example regarding <coughs> uh, the issue of uh, conservation, because um, meanwhile we have 62 works in our collection. So when I, uh, I showed you the numbers from the Guggenheim, who have 22, so it's really a lot compared, you know, to this specific focus on software and net-based works within the collection. The one word movie example also shows how complex that is and we all know it, we buy a computer and as soon as we leave uh, the store it's already outdated sort of. So how addressing these issues? We have to work with programmers, with people from very different fields, for example into emulation where you work kind of uh, um, using software that mimics older software and makes your system believe it runs on an, on an older computer, for example. They have been developed mostly by uh, young gamers, by amateurs who just wanted to play their old games. So I think the museum as an institution has to really open up and diversify and allow many new uh, collaborations. That's important. And uh, what about you guys in terms of like your practice? Do you think that there's, do you feel like certain responsibilities to, I don't know, to like other voices, to alternative perspectives? Like what are those main motivations? So obviously, you know, with the idea of like the lack of women representation, obviously speaking as, as a, a woman curator and a woman writer, that it's important that we begin to kind of support those things then as well through our practices and through the kind of things that we do. But is there other means or do you think maybe there's other kind of like broader ways or broader strategies that would allow maybe kind of more diversification to take place and maybe to help us kind of shift maybe kind of what digital culture could be then as well? Big uh, question. Okay, I'm, I'm going to start with, with women. Um, I, I've, I mean, I never think about the women issue. Sometimes I have a critical look at my blog and I think I'm quite okay. I, I, I naturally uh, interview or get in contact with women, but I know in my everyday life, I, uh, I, I, I realize it's like someone was writing me, uh, emailing, uh, inviting me to a festival, and there were problems with the flights, and his name sounded like, a, like the name of a girl, and I was really annoying to have him, to have that person uh, find me a better connection. And then I met him and I realized it was a guy and, and, I, and I thought, oh, if, I had knew, if I had known it was, a, it was a man, I would never have been so annoying with my, with my flight connection. So like, things that should be obvious to us as women are not necess necessarily like, like that. So I think an important part is the realization. And I also find really super interest, in, interested I think it's super important that we involve people from other social cultural background or for other culture. And really I found it um, difficult to address it. I mean, through uh, education, like, like Sabine was saying, it's, it's really important. But if I, um, I recently I was, I was working on evaluating a, a report on um, Fab Labs. And even Fab Labs, they really reflect uh, the same problem as we have, like lack, lack of women, um, like no engagement with uh, like people who just immigrated or, or are second generation uh, immigrants in, in the country. So I, I think education could be an important tool to change things. Um, yeah, I don't know. We need to I know that. it's 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 hard. I mean, like I think definitely think that education is probably one of the biggest concerns, or one of the biggest ways in which we can improve these things through like workshops and through events as well that kind of uh, encourage participation as well. And the types of language that we use as well is also a really important strategy as well. You talked, I don't can't remember, I think it was somebody here, um, that talked about kind of like the use of language is, is a really important tool to allow us to kind of like open up these spaces for discourse and as well. But yeah, it's uh, super great. Uh, I think we have, do we have any like, questions from the audience? Because I know that we're like tied on kind of time then as well. Okay, sorry.
Thank you. Um, I actually have a question regarding audience um, outreach for all three of your projects. Um, I'm wondering, since you're so well connected to the whole digital expert world, if you're actually using some kind of algorithmic means to reach new audiences, maybe integrating random outreach, because you're saying randomly picking up your magazine in a store had generated great contacts. Um, so I was just wondering if that is something that has been developed or that you could be working on to reach not only very specifically, you know, bubble audiences, but audiences outside. Um, that's funny, that's kind of almost like flipping like what, you know, experts try to do for many years, like try to really target um, audiences by their age and their money. It's like the reverse of that. So no, no, we don't do any of that. Also because we don't have the means so much. We're a very small team and we generally suck at marketing and like doing these things so we can only rely. So what we can do, what we put a lot of care into is how we orchestrate or how we compose the magazine. We sweat a lot about language. And this is a point that I wanted to uh, uh, bring up again, um, that we get so many artist statements or like catalog essays and stuff, and it's kind of like you can tell it's that they ran through kind of like the the usual suspects of of words and and terminology, and and uh, and and we really try to stay away from 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 these things, and uh, and that is also really important when you work with contributors because some of the experts, you know, they kind of they 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 operate within um, academic circles, and they have the knowledge, but they are not necessarily always the the best ones to to transport that knowledge or to bring it across, and uh, we spend a lot of time just you know massaging text and kind of like chiseling away things um, you know that just uh, that can't be uh, computed by a broader audience, and it's really that's I think that is probably one of the biggest uh, um, uh, purposes or responsibilities of the magazines to really like uh, uh, be accessible and to to make this stuff. Uh, um, I don't know, just legible to to a broader audience, because like it's it really it's you know the experts they like to hang out together and like talk among themselves in their ivory towers, and this is kind of um, you know kind of the magazine is kind of the opposite opposite approach to that. Uh, also, from our side, no algorithmic processes used so far. I mean, we do a lot uh, on, you know, s through social media channels also, you know, because financially it's just not possible for us as a smaller institution to pay for big billboards, for example, might help too. But anyway, so we try on the way we use the social media is also that we try to be a platform sort of, you know, to just not post uh, what we are doing, but also what we find interesting, so people really come back to our site because they get, you know, interesting other reviews and uh, and information. So yeah, and then of course it's really uh, the VR show that uh, I showed um, was one of our most successful shows, clearly because of the hype about the medium at the moment. And it was really word of mouth, I would say. Visitors seeing the show, spreading the word, bringing other people. That's also still quite important. Yeah, definitely not using any kind of algorithm at all. I actually have no idea what my stats are. But I have the feeling, because if, if I have a look at who's contacting me or who's following me on Twitter, I have the feeling that my audience has changed. It used to be mostly interaction designer, but many years ago, huh? and uh, digital artist. And now really the people who invite me to give workshops or lectures or to come and see their biennale or festival are people from the, uh, I'm going to call them traditional contemporary art world or people in, involved in, in activism. So I think I'm a bit outside of, um, uh, the bubble of of media art at the moment, um, yeah. But yeah, definitely no algorithm. Yeah, but, I think but it's a good idea. It's a good idea. <laughs> This 
idea of uh, digital culture is it's becoming more and more mainstream, so we can't kind of ignore or deny that. So obviously, with it naturally progresses to kind of uh, to we're going to naturally progress to encounter new audiences then as well. So I think that this is like just a healthy part, and the types of conversations that we're having through these panels and through these types of criticism is actually very healthy for the field and for kind of the progression of culture in general. So I mean, some of the things I'm beginning to kind of take away is importance is really the fact that we need to kind of place a, a greater importance on kind of the types of things that we are saying and the types of things that we are doing with our audiences as well. So I think that's quite a, a, a nice thing, to especially to hear from like three people who I see, I feel are quite like prominent within the field then as well. And, uh, sorry, do we have another question or was that, I thought there was a hand. Okay, good. Um, so I think that is, a, it's really quite healthy to kind of, to, to be thinking about these things. And like, uh, just because we're saying something like criticism doesn't necessarily mean that it's negative. So I actually kind of quite enjoyed your perspective about like, yes, okay, I'm probably going to make everybody hate me in the room, but I actually think it's really good. It's necessary. Exactly. It's necessary. Yeah, for sure. So I think actually the, sometimes the most difficult conversations to be having are actually probably the most important ones to be having then as well. And so obviously it's clear that there's kind of lots of issues that are uh, happening within digital culture that is important that we begin to kind of, uh, to begin to kind of, to maybe to address these true serious, true even more serious dialogue. And then maybe we are beginning to push away a little bit, or at least I hope we're beginning to push away from this idea of just posting content from press releases. At least these types of avenues are beginning, are supporting those types of engagement then as well. So I think we really have to wrap up, yes. But so I really want to thank all of the speakers. It's been really amazing and it's really interesting to see. I know that we didn't have um, too much time for uh, dialogue, but we can always continue that over lunch then as well. Thank you so much. <laughs>